Order. Uh, questions without notice, Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to <coughs> Senator Betts, Minister representing the Minister for Environment and Water Resources. And I would ask, can the minister confirm that the Howard government has slashed renewable energy research programs, closing down the Energy R&D Corporation, the CRC for Renewable Energy and the Renewable Energy Commercialisation Program? Isn't it a fact there is now almost no federal funding for research into renewable energy technologies? Isn't this why many world-leading renewable technologies that originated in Australia, like the evacuated tubes for solar hot water, solar thermal concentrators, silver cells for solar electricity, have been forced overseas? Why has the Howard government abandoned Australia's world-leading research into renewable energy and forced our leading scientists to move overseas? Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. The uh, brief answer to the Honourable Senator's question is no, but allow me to expand on it. Comprehensive uh, strategies are in place, underpinned by almost $3.5 billion worth of investment, contributing to an 87 million tonne a year cut in emissions by 2010. Recently announced initiatives by the Howard government has included $336 million green vouchers for schools, $252 million solar hot water rebates, etc. Et but uh, we also have invested uh, $15 million in the Future Gen International Partnership. We have uh, invested uh, $70.7 million, $5 million for the Asia Pacific Network for Energy Technology. 50 million to support further actions through the APP and 15.7 million for increased regional expertise in forest management. And uh, so, Mr. President, the list goes on. The Australian Labor Party can try and make the claim, as he does all the time, that somehow it has been the champion of uh, climate change. The simple facts are these. We were the ones that introduced the Australian Greenhouse Office in 1998. Thereafter, thereafter, there were literally years, a full 12 months would go by without the Labor Party asking a single question about climate change or global warming. Indeed, if you do a search of Hansard from 1998 up until May 2007, the vast majority of questions in this area have in fact been asked by coalition senators. The only time that the Labor Party have asked more questions on this issue than the coalition has in fact been in the last 12 months. And that is why I coined the phrase of Kevin's come lately to this issue, because it was only with Mr Rudd did they finally decide this might be an issue. Before that, we as a government had been developing policies and investing Australian taxpayers' dollars in ensuring that we were well positioned around the world in relation to these issues. We have, Mr President, and we have a very good record. And Mr President, uh, all I would suggest to uh, Senator Carr is that rather than accepting questions from the uh, Question Time Committee, he and Senator Sherry has interjected embarrassingly for Senator Carr to say that Senator Carr had, had actually crafted the question himself. And Senator Sherry is confirming that. In that case, Mr President, the fault does not lie with the Question Time Committee. Chances are Senator Sherry is a member of it and he wants to defend himself. And so if it, and so it, so if it is all Senator Carr's work, Mr order, President, order, I suggest order, that his supplementary order. might be pe pe Point of order, Senator Carr? Yeah, the point of order. Order. Mr. Mr President, the minister was asked a specific question about the government closing down the Energy R&D Corporation, the CRC for Renewable Energy and the Renewable Energy Commercialisation Program. The question went to why was the government forcing Australian scientists, who are expert in renewable energy, overseas? The minister has failed to answer. Can you draw him to the question? The, 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 the minute, order.
Order. Order. Senator Betts, do you have anything to add to that previous answer? Yes, I have. Oh. <laughs> Senator Carr, supplementary question? Uh, I'd ask the minister again, uh, Mr. President, if he could answer the question about the closure of these research programs and the government's policy to force Australian scientists overseas. I'd further ask, is the minister aware that Pacific Solar sold the rights to its silicon on glass technology to a German firm which is now developing and commercialising this technology? Don't Australians now have to import evacuated tubes for solar hot water from China, even though this technology was first developed at Sydney University? Doesn't the Howard government's failure to keep these great innovations in renewable energy in Australia show that after 11 long years it still hasn't taken seriously the question of climate change? Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thought I had outlined uh, quite fully in my answer to the previous uh, question that we do take the issue of climate change very seriously. And that is why we have the raft of investments that I just referred the Honourable Senator to. But of course, what happens is you have a pre written supplementary question which has to be prattled out irrespective of the answer that is given. And that is the uh, difficulty that the Australian Labor Party. Uh, Suffer from, but the situation is, Mr. President, that uh, we, as a government, have been uh, instrumental in the uh, Solar Cities uh, program. For example, we have been. Uh, Order, Senator Carr. Uh, and the poor honourable senator, interjecting as he does, I thought was a senator that allegedly represented the state of Victoria, that has actually entered a partnership, the state Labor government has entered into a partnership with a federal coalition government Order. to develop a Order. solar city your in his state. Your time has expired. Before I call Senator Humphreys, I understand the Leader of the Government has a statement regarding ministerial arrangements. Thanks, Mr <laughs> President. I missed the call earlier. I did want to make sure that the Senate was aware that Senator George Brandis, the Minister for Arts and Sport, uh, is absent from question time today, as I guess is obvious. Um, Senator Brandis is fortunate enough to be representing Australia at the World Anti-Doping Agency meeting in Montreal in Canada, and I'm sure we all wish we were with him. Um, during Senator Brandis's order, absence— Order! 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 Senator Conroy. During Senator Brandis's absence, Senator Don Helen Coonan has agreed to take questions in relation to the arts and sports and the education, science and training portfolios. Thank Senate, you, Mr President. Senator Humphreys. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, indeed, my question is to Senator Coonan, in this case uh, representing, the minister, uh, representing the Assistant Treasurer. Uh, would the minister outline, please, to the Senate how the last 11 years of sound economic management have delivered benefits to all Australians? Could she also outline, in particular, how the government proposes to build on the strong economic performance of the last 11 years to deliver benefits to older Australians? And uh, could she also tell us, are there any alternative policies? Senator Coonan. Good question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And I thank Senator Humphreys uh, for his question and note that when the coalition was elected in 1996, the unemployment in the ACT was 7.7 per cent. And after 11 years <laughs> of sound economic management that Senator Humphreys refers to, the unemployment today in the ACT stands at just 2.8 per cent. The sound economic management of the Howard government has, of course, <laughs> allowed us to deliver real benefits to all Australians and to invest in the future to ensure that we, as a nation, continue to prosper. It's allowed us to pay off $96 billion of Labor's debt and save right. in the order of $8 billion annually in interest. And as we strive to do even better, we should not forget the economic mismanagement of Labor governments past, where out of 13 budgets they ran deficits in nine of them. There is no clearer example of how sound economic management enables Australians to directly benefit than the recent better superannuation reforms. From today, an estimated 300,000 older Australians will be able to access the pension for the first time or will receive a higher pension. Today we are cutting the taper rates at which pensions are reduced by half 
to $1.50 for, uh, $1 for each $1,000 of assets above the allowable limits for the full pension. Mr. President, we are also substantially lifting the allowable asset limits, at which point the pension begins to be reduced. As a result, the maximum single pension will rise, single rate pension will rise by $12.60 to $537.70 per fortnight, and the partnered pension rate for each member of a couple will rise by $10.60 to $449.10 per fortnight. Yeah. And as a result of the reform to indexation, Pensions will again rise above the inflation rate, which means that the Howard government is actually delivering, in real terms, a sustained increase in the standard of living of older Australians. These significant reforms Mr. President, are only possible because of sound economic management over the last 11 years. And if we were to have ducked the tough questions that have set Australia up to build on our prosperity and to lock in our future prosperity, we'd not be in a position to reform the pension scheme and to deliver such significant increases to pensioners and particularly older Australians. And, Mr President, uh, as the storm clouds gather once again over the international economy, strong and experienced hands are now more than ever required on, uh, on the rudder of the Australian <laughs> economy. Mr Rudd's startling admission yesterday that he could not even name one single tax threshold correctly, let alone name any of the actual tax rates, proves once and for all that he is an opposition leader on trainer wheels. Order. Australians have every right to ask if you don't know or care enough about how much tax ordinary Australian wage earners pay, how could you trust Mr Rudd with Order. your mortgage? Order. You can't run an economy on spin alone, and this latest failure just highlights that Mr Rudd is not fit to run Australia's $1.1 trillion economy. And finally, Mr President, it is wonderful that uh, Rip Van Winkle, Senator Faulkner, has finally woken up. Order. When you've finished, Senator Evans, your colleague will get the call. Senator Carol Brown. My question is to Senator Abetz, Minister representing the Minister for the Environment and Water Resources. Is the Minister aware that the 2005 Tracking the Kyoto Target report forecasts that Australia's greenhouse gas emissions would rise by 22 per cent between 1990 and 2020? Doesn't the 2006 edition of this report show that our emissions will rise by 27 per cent between 1990 and 2020? five per cent more than predicted previously. Can the minister explain why the government's own projections of greenhouse, em greenhouse emissions are getting worse? Doesn't this show that after 11 long years in office, the Howard government has failed to tackle our greenhouse emissions? Why, hasn't the Howard government so why has the Howard government so comprehensively failed to reduce emissions to help combat climate change? Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I don't know where Senator Brown's been hiding in recent times, but uh, she would be aware, for example, that uh, at APEC we raise the issue of climate change as a very important issue for world leaders. And interestingly enough, it was the Australian government, under the leadership of Prime Minister Howard and Foreign Minister. Alexander Downer and Environment Minister Malcolm Turnbull that actually put it on the agenda. Now, when the alternate Prime Minister, Mr. President, had the opportunity to engage with the United States President on this issue for a full 45 minutes, what did Mr. Rudd do? Did not mention the issue of climate change. Did not issue the mention. Uh, did not mention the issue of climate change. Why? Because, Mr President, for cheap domestic purposes he seeks to raise climate change, but when he can actually do something about it, like engaging positively with the President of the United States, he squibs it. He squibs it. He's unable to deal with the issue. Now, Mr President, for the first time ever, because of Australia's handling of this issue, we were able to get the countries of, the, uh, of Russia China and the United States to sit down together 
and talk about this issue in a very, very constructive way. And Senator Carr can interject and says it's all aspirational and all sorts of things. But can I tell you this? Talking about climate change at least is better than not talking about it, like Mr. Rudd did. Like Mr. Rudd did. And that is, Mr. President, a classic case. A classic case of Australia taking the challenge of climate change very, very seriously. Now, Mr. President, the Climate Institute's analysis should focus on the energy sector, where its consultants have expertise and where available data might be uh, more reliable. But the government's emission projections to 2010, released in December last year, uh, draws on detailed economic modelling of all sectors prepared by Australia's leading experts in the field and show that Australia is performing well against its Kyoto target. The latest national greenhouse accounts provide complete and comprehensive data on Australia's greenhouse emissions and show that Australia's greenhouse gas emissions were 102.2 per cent of 1990 levels in 2005. And these results are consistent with the latest projections. Both Australia's national greenhouse accounts and emission projections are prepared by the Australian Greenhouse Office according to international guidelines and subject to international review. Australia has produced annual inventories, as I understand it now, uh, for quite some time. And so, Mr. President, yes, we are always <coughs> monitoring, we're always looking at this. Uh, Issue. And indeed, later this day, later this day, this Senate will be debating legislation dealing with this very issue. And so, what I invite Senator Brown to do is to have a look at the actual record of what's happening. Now, this is Senator Carol Brown, the more sensible of the two Senator Browns, might I add. But uh, on this occasion, she hasn't covered herself in glory with the uh, question that's been provided to her. But having said that, Mr. President, we as a government do take climate change very seriously. We have taken the appropriate uh, action, and that is why, in the world arena, we are regarded as leaders, and that is why the APEC community Order. was so willing to engage Order, with Minister. us in Sydney the time just has recently. Expired. Supplementary question, Senator Carol Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. Doesn't the fa fact that the Australia's emissions keep getting worse, even after all the warnings about climate sh change, show the need for a clear target for emission reductions? Doesn't the government's total failure to provide business and consumers with the certainty of a clear target undermine the effort to seriously tackle climate change? Senator Betts. Mr. Mr. President, we were, talking, we were just told about Australians being concerned about reducing emissions. Guess what? Just recently, we as a government circulated to every household in Australia what they could do about this issue. And who were the ones that condemned us? Who were the ones that condemned us? The Australian Labor Party, the people that today are now feigning concern about this issue. See, the Labor Party can't have it both ways. Either it's a matter of national significance for every single citizen in Australia, and therefore they should be assisted in engaging on this important issue. But then when we do it, we are condemned. We raise it at APEC. Mr Rudd doesn't raise it at APEC, but of course they're the alleged champions. Mr President, it is another classic case of Labor saying, do as we say, not as we do, whereas we are actually taking the hard actions, Order. engaging with people Order, to ensure we get good results. Order. 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 Senator Joyce. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Community Services, Senator Scullion. Will the minister inform the Senate of the, on the progress of the national emergency intervention in the Northern Territory and any recent developments? Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr President, uh, I'd like to thank the senator for his question and, and acknowledge the advice that he's been provided to government in regard to Indigenous affairs over some time, particularly his experience with Indigenous people in his hometown of St George. Um, on Tuesday, um, I informed the Senate of a suite of measures totalling some $740 million 
uh, that are going to address the longer-term needs of, of the Northern Territory. Uh, some $540 million to repair and build housing in remote communities over the next four years, $100 million for more doctors, nurses and allied health professionals and specialist services, $78.2 million over three years to convert CDEP positions to real jobs, up to $30 million to be matched on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis to assist the Northern Territory Government to meet their obligations in this regard, $18.5 million over two years for 66 additional Australian Federal Police. Uh, Mr President, uh, today I'm pleased also to announce the negotiation of another 99-year lease, this time over the township of Ski Beach. Uh, Ski Beach is, an, is a township adjacent to the mining town of Nullumboy um, in the north and east, northeastern area of the Northern Territory. Negotiations will proceed with the Gumach people to bring better services and economic development to the region. The 99-year lease negotiations are proceeding at the urging of Galaroy Unipingu, who took the initiative to approach the minister over a 99-year lease over his home community. This 99-year 99 99-year lease to the Australian government over the township itself will bring a solid foundation to take advantage of the economic opportunities, allowing residents to participate in the Australian economy and provide for normalised land-based tenure. This will also be the first time. Uh, for the chance for home ownership and also the reality is given we know in places like New Yew in the Tiwi Islands, which has been agreed in principle also on Groot Island, which is uh, not far from Nullumboy. Negotiations will con commence immediately with the aim of having the new arrangements in place in early 2008. When it proceeds, the secure tenure which the 99-year leases will bring will remove the need for a statutory five-year lease. Uh, that was provided under the Emergency Response Act in the Northern Territory. This lease will, of course, Mr. President, uh, provide, uh, move uh, land from ownership in a collective sense um, to the prospect of individual owners and ownership and control. So, for the very first time, Mr. President, uh, these Aboriginal Australians will be able to directly control what happens on their own land and will be able to invest in their own future and their family's future and that economic prosperity, Mr. President. It is actually interesting that there are a great deal of opportunities that have, uh, uh, have been around the place here in around Nullumboy. Ski Beach faces uh, the, the, the water, and on the other side, as you look across the bay, you can actually see that the mining township. Of course, there are a great deal of yachts. There's, a, there's a, an emerging maritime industry there. We currently don't have a small slipway, so there's an opportunity for a slipway, for chandleries, for a high boat businesses, and for other tourist enterprises. But again, Mr. President, the bottom line is enterprise. The, uh, the government is more than happy to support the Aboriginal communities and their aspirations for economic independence. We have, a, we have a plan that has been developed in consultation with Indigenous Australians, and we have another interjection from uh, Senator Crossan, uh, Mr. President, disappointingly again saying, are we going to be providing money for that? We are providing an environment where Indigenous Australians enjoy the same level of opportunity as other Australians. This is a fantastic initiative by a government that is happy to provide leadership, not froth and bubble and media stunts, Mr. President. This is a government about making absolutely sound decisions, sticking to them and implementing them. Order. 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 Senator Wortley. Mr President, my question is to Senator Abetz, Minister representing the Minister for the Environment and Water Resources. I refer the Minister to briefing notes provided to the APEC Finance Minister's meeting in Coolum that say about climate change that, and I quote, to complement market-based mechanisms, there is also a role for regulation and direct government intervention to assist in the development of low emission technologies. Don't leading business groups support this view? Hasn't the Australian Business Roundtable on Climate Change expressed support for policies that actively encourage the development of renewable energy technologies? Why is the Howard government ignoring business by calling for state-based targets to be abolished and refusing to increase the mandatory renewable energy target from the current pathetic 2 per cent level? Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The uh, reason for the request for the states to abolish uh, their uh, uh, mandatory uh, targets is because uh, 
That is what the uh, Prime Minister's task force, in fact, actually recommended, and in fact, businesses would prefer there to be the one target for all of Australia rather than all the various uh, state targets, which, uh, if I might say, is a bit of a mishmash. And I think uh, most uh, people who are concerned about industry are concerned that there be one, uh, one agreed a target right around Australia, because otherwise, uh, if you happen to have an aluminium smelter, let's say in Tasmania, you might have to pay more for energy than if you had an uh, aluminium smelter in uh, in uh, Queensland, simply on the basis of uh, the targets. And so uh, it makes good sense. But we, as a government, have uh, said time and time again that uh, things such as mandatory renewable energy targets have their purpose, and indeed. We introduced them and uh, I think they have served a very useful purpose. In relation to regulations, well, uh, today this uh, Senate will be debating legislation uh, requiring reporting uh, conditions on uh, particular businesses above a certain threshold. And so all those factors to which the Honourable Senator is referring to <coughs> are factors that we have taken into account, we have dealt with and we are dealing with in a comprehensive way, which in fact has the backing of the Prime Minister's Emissions Task Force. And if I might say with great respect to the Honourable Senator, that Emissions Task Force brought together the best brains available to us in relation to this area. And that is why we as a government are being very heavily influenced by its advice to government rather than the stunt a day from the likes of Mr Garrett, who one day would close down our coal mines and kick 36,000 people out of work, and then when asked, what about the jobs, he said that's hypothetical, as though coal mining jobs are somehow hypothetical. They are real jobs sustaining thousands of families and hundreds of communities around Australia. And, and, uh, Mr. And Mr. Uh, Order. Now, Mr President, the arrogant leader of the opposition continues his interjection. As soon as one of his senators gets into trouble, we get the arrogant barrage. But uh, wh what I would say to the honourable senator, who is in fact actually listening to my answer, unlike you, uh, Senator Evans. Mr President, am I going to get a chance to address uh, Senator Wortley's question Continue without the answer. ongoing arrogant barrage Order. of the Leader of the Opposition. Continue. So what I am suggesting to uh, Senator Wortley and the few like her on the Opposition side who I think might actually be interested in this topic that uh, she should read the Emissions Task Force. I do have a copy available in my office and I think she would find that it sets out a blueprint that will be within this nation's interest for many years to come. Supplementary question, Senator Wortley. I do have a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that renewable energy under the Howard government will decline as a proportion of electricity consumption over the next decade? Does this minister consider the decline of renewable energy to be a successful outcome? Doesn't this in fact show that after 11 long years in office, the Howard government still isn't serious about climate change. Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The one thing that I did like about the Honourable Senator's question was the suggestion that in the next 10 years of the Howard government there might be a particular decline in uh, renewable energy. What I would say to the Honourable Senator is that I hope that the first part of the question is right, that, that we will see another 10 years of Howard government, but I would also hope that uh, renewable energy will continue to grow and increase. And that is why such initiatives, such as in uh, the Honourable Senator's neighbouring state of Victoria of solar cities, is so very important. Something that the Labor senators Order. opposite don't want to hear about, but I, can, but I can tell them and advise them that their own state Labor government in Victoria wants to know about it, because they have actually partnered with us, Mr. President, in this very important initiative. And uh, what I would invite the honourable uh, senator to do, Order. if she can still hear my answer Order. above the arrogance senator of the Sherry. leader of the opposition, uh, demonstrating his arrogance. Well, time is expired. 
Order. Senator Sherry. Order. Senator Bushby. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Abetz. Will the, minister, will the Minister update the Senate on the latest information about workplace agreement making in Australia? What does this information say about the Howard government's modern and flexible industrial relations policies? And is the Minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Betts. Mr President, can I uh, congratulate Senator Bushby on an excellent first speech yesterday and uh, say that uh, he has followed up superbly today with an excellent question uh, being his first one. And, uh, Mr President, I note from his maiden speech last night that uh, the question that he's asking a question about today is a matter in which he is genuinely interested. Mr President, yesterday the latest official report on agreement making in the Australian workplace was released. Like a number of reports before it, this report totally debunks the false claims being made by the ALP and the ACTU about, in particular, Australian workplace agreements. So let's compare what the Labor Party has been saying has been happening with what is actually revealed in this document. Let's start with working hours. Those on the other side were asserting, Mr President, that people are working longer hours. In fact, that is wrong. Average weekly hours worked are now at 37.3, albeit minimal, but a decline from 37.4. How about wages? The ALP and ACTU falsely claim the AWAs are forcing down wages. Well, wrong again. Average hourly total earnings on non -managerial for non-managerial employees on AWAs actually increased by 12.8 per cent. They did not decline. But what about wages under AWAs compared to collective agreements? The rise under collective increments or agreements 4.1 per cent. So that AWAs 12.8 per cent collective agreements 4.1 per cent. And of course, Mr President, I could go on further. What does all this say about the Howard government's flexible modern workplace relations system, Mr President? It says it is working for the benefit of Australian workers and their families, and it says that the false scare campaign against it is exactly that, false. Yet despite all this, Labor still maintain their ridiculous position that they will rip up AWAs, the central feature of our modern industrial relations system. They will rip up these modern flexible arrangements which provide 8.7 per cent more for workers than under collective agreements. So why, Mr President, would Labor persist in defying common sense on this? Well, Mr President, I think we know the answer. It's the trade union movement. And I came across a very interesting quote yesterday, and uh, I would invite those opposite to guess who said it. The trade union movement keeps the parliamentary Labor Party in touch with the values and aspirations of working people. It is their greatest source of cohesion. And I might be able to say, Mr President, that without the union movement, the Labor Party would rely on a rainbow alliance of single-issue groups, environmentalists, peace activists, gays and civil libertarians. But, of course, I don't have to say that, because the person who said the quote actually said that as well. So with the Labor Party, if it's not the trade union movement, you get a rainbow coalition of environmentalists, peace activists, gays and civil libertarians. So that's the choice in the Labor Party. And do you know who said it? Senior frontbencher Dr Craig Emerson, who would be the small business minister under a Rudd Labor government. Can I say to those listening, Mr President, that that is the scary prospect of a Rudd Labor government, whereas we on this side, Mr President, understand the needs Order. of the 80 per cent of workers Order. who Your are not in trade expired, unions. Senator Betts. A supplementary question. Senator Bushby. Minister, as you have indicated that there have been significant improvements in industrial relations policies. Could you elaborate further on how these changes have contributed to an increase in the number of Australians in work? 
Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President, a very, very important supplementary question. There were, since the changes in March 2006, over 417,000 Australians now have a job. 417,000 yeah, Australians. Yeah, yeah. And, Mr. President, you can argue about how many were actually as a result of our changes, but as an absolute minimum, some of those commentators who are as harsh as one might expect on us say that at least over half of them are as a result of the abolition of the unfair, unfair dismissal laws. And of course, the Labor Party would reintroduce that regime and see all those people that have gained employment as a result of us taking tough initiatives lose their jobs and lose the opportunities that have been provided to them. And, Mr President, that, I think, is one of the great achievements of the Howard government. Real wages growth, lowest rate of industrial disputation and a 33-year low in Order. unemployment, and that is a Order, huge Senator social Betts. dividend Your for this country. Expired. Order. Order. Senator Sherry. Order. Order. Senator Fielding. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General, Order. Senator, Senator Johnson. Fielding. Senators on my left, I cannot hear Senator Fielding's question. Order. 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 We will not proceed until the Senate comes to order. Senator Sherry, I will not ask you again. Senator Fielding. Thanks, Mr. President. I'll start again. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Johnston. Minister, as you are aware, in December last year, the government changed the law so that recreational fishermen caught dropping a line in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Green Zones would no longer receive criminal convictions. While the government fixed its mess, there are still 324 fishermen who were prosecuted before the law was changed and who now have all criminal records. Minister, given the government has only partly fixed the problem Order. and given it now admits this breach is not criminal activity, Will it now rescind the criminal convictions of these 324 fishermen and grant them all a pardon? Senator Johnston. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and may I thank Senator Fielding for what is a very important question to those 300 fishermen who now feel aggrieved given that there has been an amendment to repair a situation that was quite anomalous. Um, can I also pause to thank Senator Boswell, who has been arguing uh, the case of those 300 fishermen for some long time now, and, uh, and I can assure Senator Fielding that I have addressed those issues with open ears. Now, I have to say that where we have convictions recorded, often on pleas of guilty, uh, in a belief that a certain set of circumstances uh, prevailed, it is now not possible to go back and review those matters because ignorance of the law is not an excuse, can I say, and there's a number of High Court cases that substantiate this. There is clearly, I think, in agreement with you, Senator Fielding, an injustice done to those 300 um, convictees, if I, if, I, if I may use that expression. Now, what I am currently doing is uh, entertaining my department and the Attorney-General's department with the request of Senator Boswell and, indeed, may I say, but I'm hoping for an answer any moment, and, and this oh, afternoon right. I have a meeting uh, with respect to precisely that problem, <laughs> and, uh, and I anticipate, through you, Mr. President, I anticipate being in a position to address whether or not it is appropriate that pardons in the face of this anomalous and unjust situation can in fact be granted. Now, I'll make sure, if I may, through you, Mr. President, inform Senator Fielding, because I do appreciate his question and his interest in this subject, because it is clear. Yeah, order. That Senator Johnson, just stop for one minute. Senators on my left, if you wish to conduct conversations, could you please leave the chamber? It is disorderly and there's far too much audible noise, and I cannot hear the minister's answer. Senator Johnson. Mr. President, Not now. I'm very. Uh, 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 enlivened by a problem where 
300 people have received convictions now with the benefit of hindsight which appear very unjust. And as I was saying to, uh, to uh, Senator Fielding through you, I am seeking to uh, obtain a, a method of being able to uh, adjust that and arrest that and remediate that injustice in a way that is within the law and acceptable. Now, it is a very difficult problem, but we are approaching and I do thank Senator Fielding for what I think is a very good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supplementary question, Senator Fielding. Yes, I do, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, as you have uh, indicated, uh, many of these fishermen have suffered enormously by being deemed a criminal in the eyes of the law. Their employment prospects, ability to get insurance or even open a bank account have all been affected. And I would be asked I kept fully informed with where it's progressed. Senator Johnston. Um, Mr. President, that's precisely the motivation behind why we are attempting to. Uh, remediate this situation. These men now do have um, a record of, of a breach of the criminal law. Uh, their travel plans and whatever you are affected, they have to declare that they have convictions against their name in circumstances where they should not have to do that in the circumstances that have evolved with respect to those offences. And I can assure Senator Fielding I am very motivated to, to, to repair this and uh, doing everything I can to see what avenues are available. And I will be back to him shortly, I hope, with a solution. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. My is to the Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Ellison. Last week, the Prime Minister announced a $330 million Veterans Affairs Disability Pension Enhancement Package, further highlighting the government's continuing support for our valued veterans. Will the Minister outline to the Senate? significant new measures to further assist the nation's widow, war widows and widowers. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Fisher for what is a very important question for our war widows and war widowers and acknowledge Senator Fisher's interest in the area of veterans affairs. Mr President, uh, the Howard government acknowledges the heavy price paid by our war widows and war widowers in the premature loss of a spouse and uh, also in relation to um, the, the, the physical condition they suffered later uh, from service-related uh, issues. Uh, Mr President, uh, we are committed to ensuring that our war widows and war widows are supported. And that is why I am very pleased to inform the Senate that the Minister for Veterans Affairs has announced a package which will greatly benefit the 114,000 war widow, widows and war widowers in Australia. Uh, in short, uh, uh, war widows and war widowers receive currently uh, a pension, a non-index uh, pension component of $25 a fortnight, formerly called a domestic allowance. Th this component will increase by $10 a fortnight to $35 from March 2008. Mr. President, this package will bring uh, to a total $470 million of packages recently announced, and Senator Fisher mentioned uh, the $330 million package recently announced by the Prime Minister in relation to the indexation of payments to veterans generally. Mr. President, uh, uh, this payment uh, in relation to war widows and war widowers will now be indexed with reference to both the consumer price index and the male total average weekly earnings uh, from March 2008. The non-index $25 pension component has remained constant uh, since it was first introduced in 1946, and this has been a great area of concern uh, for those uh, war widow widows and war widowers who have been uh, in receipt of that. The government has therefore responded positively, Mr. President, and uh, with these new measures, we will increase the value of this pension component and ensure that its real value is maintained through indexation. This is very good news for that sector of the community, 114,000 war widows and war widowers who will benefit from this. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the commitment of the Howard government to the veterans sector is underlined by the fact that more than $1.6 billion in new funding has been allocated to veterans affairs in the last 18 months. That is a significant increase in funding. In fact, Mr. President, Despite declining veteran numbers, the Department of Veterans Affairs budget has increased from $6.5 billion in 1996 
to more than $11 billion today. And, uh, Mr President, I thought the opposition would be interested to know that, because this is of great concern and interest to our veterans community in this country. A substantial increase in funding over the last 11 years of from $6.5 billion to $11 billion to ensure that our veterans are supported and those war widows and war widowers who paid the heavy price of a premature loss of a spouse because of the service they, this country are now supported. And Mr President, it is important that we continue to support this sector of the community which paid such a price. This announcement today, as I say, takes the total package of recent, recent announcements, announcements to, to $470 million of new initiatives. And this is good news for the veterans community who well, well deserve uh, these initiatives. And uh, I applaud the minister for his announcement today and continued commitment to the, the veterans uh, sector. Thank you, Minister. Senator Crossan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to uh, Senator Coonan, the minister representing uh, uh, the uh, Minister for Communications, IT, Technology and the Arts, and I refer the minister to her claim yesterday that Telstra had Mr John Utting on its payroll. Can the minister confirm that she today received a letter from Telstra expressly stating that neither Mr Utting nor his firm have any financial relationship with Telstra? Hasn't Mr Utting confirmed this in a letter to Telstra today? which states, and I quote, neither MUR Research nor I have either a current or recent financial relationship with Telstra. Can the minister now confirm that Telstra has had only one pollster on their books in recent years, namely the Liberal Party's pollsters Crosby Texter? And will the minister now correct the record and apologise to Mr Utting Telstra, the Senate and the Australian people for her false claims in question time yesterday. Order, order, order. I will not call the minister until there's order. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, well, I don't know who Telstra has uh, as their uh, pollsters, and uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, the Labor Party can ask Telstra who their pollsters are. They, they certainly don't tell me. Um, I don't. Order, Senator Coonan, take seat. I'm not going to let the minister continue until there is order on this side. It is your question time. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do not have letters from uh, either Mr Utting or Telstra uh, with me. I understand from my office that there are some letters in my office. Uh, I would certain. I would certainly wish to have a look Order. at them before I make any response, given the aggressive stance taken by uh, Telstra towards me personally Very and Very to the wise. government. I think it only appropriate that I have an opportunity to consider the contents of any correspondence that might be addressed to me, and that is what I will do. Uh, if any uh, correction is required, it will be made, Mr President. And uh, I fully expect that what I will have received from Telstra Order. is an unequivocal commitment that they will stop meddling with the Labor Party and meddling with the election, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that they will retract uh, allegations that they have made against me, and that yeah. they will continue to behave like the major corporation they are and be completely out of the election as far as a partisan participant. Order. 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 Supplementary question, Senator Crossan. Um, Mr President, isn't it uh, true that, in fact, yesterday uh, this minister told uh, the Senate in question time, and I quote from yesterday's parliament, we all know that Telstra have John Utting, <coughs> Labor's pollster, on their payroll. And why is it then that when the minister can't win the policy debate, she resorts to bizarre personal attacks on Telstra in the parliament? And doesn't the minister's increasingly desperate and paranoid behaviour show her complete incompetence in the fact that she has lost control of her portfolio? Order. 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 
Senator Kernan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, and isn't it extraordinary that Senator Conroy doesn't have the guts to ask uh, either right, that yeah, question? Right. And he gets poor old Senator Crossan to try to be uncivil right. uh, in asking a question in question time. This just shows the pathetic approach of Senator Conroy and the Labor Party to telecommunications. They can't win a policy debate, and all they can do is to try to get into bed with Order. Telstra and to try to win an election by those means. Order. Order. Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Minchin. I draw the Minister's attention to the I draw the Minister's attention to the resolution agreed to without dissent by the Senate this morning, supporting the establishment of a Royal Commission into the sexual assault and abuse of children throughout Australia. Can the Minister advise the Senate if and when the Prime Minister will be responding to or acting on this very important and significant resolution? Senator Minchin. Uh, uh, Mr President, could I um First, um, acknowledge Senator Bartlett's um, quite uh, long-term, consistent, and diligent application of his time and energy to uh, this greatest of evils—the sexual abuse and of children, and abuse generally of children. Um, I'm sure there's not a senator in this place who does not share his overwhelming concern for this, as I say, great public evil uh, that is abroad in our community. Regrettably, um, it was. Um, uh, the fact that we were happy to join with uh, Senator Bartlett and his colleagues in supporting the uh, resolution this morning as a mark of our good faith and uh, our concern as a government um, to do all that we possibly can to deal with uh, child abuse in our community. Um, and indeed, this subject is of considerable notoriety this week, given the appalling case of the a person who had came from New Zealand with his daughter, his three-year-old daughter, having um, uh, that uh, child's uh, mother having apparently been murdered in New Zealand, and the child being left alone and abandoned at a Melbourne railway station. Uh, in other words, child abuse can take many forms, and that's one of the most appalling forms of child abuse uh, that I'm aware of. And of course, uh, while all of us are concerned about it, uh, those of us who are privileged to be parents. Um, uh, of which I am one, uh, feel it most particularly and um, feel enormous anger and despair when we read almost daily of most dreadful cases of child abuse in this country. Uh, regrettably, one of the phenomena of the um, breakdown of marriage seems to be that child abuse increases when single mothers um, who find themselves in new relationships uh, find that their new partners uh, do not have the same respect for children that uh, parents always have. And it is despairing to read of cases uh, almost every week uh, where uh, child abuse occurs within the family environment, often in those sorts of situations. Um, Mr President, whether or not the uh, commissioning of a royal commission for a major national inquiry into this matter is the best way about it, I think is a matter for legitimate debate. Uh, whether such a, a royal commission uh, is the best way to go about uh, dealing with this from a national government level, I think is something we're prepared to consider. That's one of the reasons we did agree to the motion, where we will consider that question. Uh, I can't give a timeline or a, a specific um, determination as to when we might respond. But in the meantime, the government, I think, has shown its good faith, and we accept that this is very much a bipartisan issue, and we would not seek to. Uh, uh, suggest that there should be any partisanship or that we're better or worse than anybody else. I, I accept the good faith of all parties on this issue, but I think our good faith uh, and determination to do something about this has been demonstrated most particularly, of course, with our intervention in the Northern Territory. That has been motivated uh, entirely by our concern for the continuing reports and evidence of appalling child abuse uh, in communities, most particularly in the Northern Territory, and it was by that motivation that we have engaged in uh, this intervention. I, frankly, as someone brought up as uh, a member of the Anglican Church, am staggered to find the uh, uh, Anglican Archbishop of Sydney questioning our motives and questioning that intervention. I think it's one of the finest things that our government has done, and we welcome the support that we've had from across the board uh, for that intervention, which, as I say, is motivated by a 
by our concern for the welfare of the children concerned. Uh, we are, uh, while much is said about the whys and wherefores and, um, of uh, uh, what is called cooperative federalism, I do note that um, we have been working very closely with uh, state uh, and territory ministers through the Community and Disability Services Ministers Order, Conference Minister. to deal with this Time issue at a national level. Supplementary question, Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd, I'd remind the minister and the Senate that the uh, coalition members expressed support. Uh, read the actual part of the resolution. Expressed support for the long-standing call for a comprehensive royal commission into the sexual assault and abuse of children throughout Australia, especially in institutions. Uh, but whilst I note so this is a, a mark of good faith, uh, I think it suggests it might be problematic if. Uh, extent of action consists of expressing support for resolutions and not actually acting on them. Uh, could uh, the minister indicate uh, whether there will be uh, uh, an indication from the government uh, before the election date at least about uh, how this support uh, for the long-standing call for a royal commission may be translated into action, even if it's not specifically matched that, caused, that called for in the resolution, some other form of action which does actually deal with child sexual abuse and assault on a, a more comprehensive nationwide way rather than an ad hoc case by case basis. Senator Minchin. Well, Mr. President, as I was saying um, before my time expired uh, in answer to the first question, um, through the relevant um, state and territory ministers' conference, there is um, an agreed national approach to child protection, <laughs> which I would assert on behalf of those ministers is a comprehensive approach by all relevant levels of government to protecting Australia's children. Um, it, it, is, uh, it was, as I say, a mark of good faith that coalition senators were happy to join in supporting the motion uh, today with respect to a royal commission, but of course that would be a matter for the Cabinet to consider that motion and determine what further action the national government might choose to take on this matter. But I just want to reassert our bona fides on this matter, our deep and abiding concern to ensure that, as a national government, we do everything we possibly can to ensure a proper nationwide comprehensive approach to the protection of Australia's children. Senator Kirk. President, my question is to Senator Coonan, Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I refer the Minister to the release of Iraq Body Counts assessment that over 79,000 civilian deaths have now occurred since 2003. I also refer the Minister to United Nations assessments that over two million Iraqis have fled their country and over one million Iraqis have been internally displaced. Does the minister agree that Iraq is a human and security catastrophe? What humanitarian assistance is the government providing to relieve the suffering in the refugee camps that now exist in Jordan and Syria and the displaced persons camps that are increasing in size within Iraq? Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you. Um to, uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Senator uh, Kirk for um, an important question. Um, there's no doubt that uh, any civilian death is one too many. I think we all agree with that. And um, there are no authoritative estimates of the total number of Iraqi civilian casualties, due in part, of course, to the complex uh, nature of the violence in Iraq. Estimates of civilian ca uh, casualties and the methodology behind them, of course, very, very widely. Uh, for example, the UK website, the Iraq Body Count, estima estimates that, as of the 6th of September, between 71,302 and 77,852 civilians have been killed since March 2003. And the United Nations Assistance Mission for Iraq estimates some 34,452 were killed in 2006, but I repeat that uh, any civilian death is certainly one too many. The multinational force in cooperation with the Iraqi security forces have strenuously sought to avoid civilian casualties in accordance with international humanitarian law, and uh, in stark contrast, uh, terrorists and insurgents have set out to kill and maim civilians and those in Iraqi security forces. The multinational force in Iraq will continue to work with Iraqi security forces to prevent such attacks and apprehend their perpetrators. Uh, Senator Kirk um, has also uh, 
ask what uh, we're doing to assist Iraqi refugees and internally displaced persons. And of course, uh, we're concerned, uh, very concerned about the humanitarian situation facing many of the Iraqis, over two million, uh, my brief note says, uh, residing in neighbouring countries and over two million internally displaced. Many of these were displaced under the uh, Saddam Hussein regime right. due to war, human rights abuses and the deliberate expulsion of citizens from their homes. Australia has provided over 75 million in humanitarian assistance, including for Iraqi refugees and uh, IDPs since 2003. And Mr Downer announced, in, uh, announced on 14 February 2007 uh, $6 million uh, to assist Iraqi refugees and $3 million uh, to the United Nations HCR and $3 million to the IOM. The Australian uh, delegation uh, was, of course, represented at the Australian UNHCR conference on Iraqi refugees and internally displaced uh, persons and was led by the ambassador and the permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva. It included officials from the Department of Immigration and Citizenship and AusAid, so uh, the personnel making up the uh, representation were very well placed to uh, have Australia's input and to record Australia's concern about this most important matter. A supplementary question, Senator Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Given that Christian families are being persecuted and brutalised on a daily basis by all factions, oil production has been slashed, Iran has been emboldened and international terrorism has been made worse, can the minister indicate whether she thinks the Australian government's assistance is having any impact at all? Senator Kernan. Well, um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we've often uh, spoken in this chamber about the importance and relevance of the Australian uh, troop commitments. Um, Australia, as uh, I've said, I think uh, last week, sometime in answer to a question, is committed to staying in Iraq until the Iraqi security forces no longer require our support. Um, the government decided in August to extend our troop commitments until the 30th of June 2008. Uh, it's important that uh, we stay and we, that we get the job done, and uh, its uh, our coalition partners have expressed their strong appreciation for Australia's uh, uh, very valuable contribution. The ongoing presence of Australia and other members of the coalition in, in Iraq is uh, at the request of the government in Iraq, and uh, we certainly do not intend to leave until, uh, until that particular job is done. I ask the further questions to be placed on the notice paper. <laughs> Senator Ellison. Mr. President, I answered a question yesterday uh, from Senator Seward in relation to uh, petrol sniffing and opal fuel. I undertook to get back to the Senate in relation to three road houses which were mentioned, and uh, I now have that information. I table that information and seek leave to incorporate it. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I move to take note of answers provided by Senator Betts to questions asked of him today in his capacity as Minister representing the Minister for the Environment. Mr. President, today a number of questions were asked of Senator Betts, which sought to uh, draw the government on what it was doing in relation to climate change. And quite frankly, it again reinforced the message that the government doesn't understand climate change, has no plan for tackling it and has been dragged reluctantly by the community to confront the issues of climate change. The government for 11 years did nothing in the face of those challenges, and it is only in recent times when the community proved that they were way out in front of the government, that the community concerns were so, uh, so strong, so loud, that the Prime Minister finally agreed to uh, establish a task force to look at the question of climate change and uh, propositions for uh, a carbon emissions uh, trading system. Now, what we uh, uh, heard in, from the minister today, uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, was that the government uh, has no idea about what's going on in terms of uh, the climate change challenge. We, we know they haven't ratified Kyoto. They, we know they stand outside the international community. We know they've let the MRET uh, run down to the point of making no practical contribution to, uh, to renewable energy in this country. We know that solar research has been cut by the government to the point that 
the major uh, uh, leading solar research technologies that were developed in this country have been forced overseas, and that Australia's leading silent, uh, scientists in solar, uh, solar matters are now working overseas due to the lack of funding, the lack of interest by this government in sol solar energy. I mean, we're at the situation now where Germany leads the field on solar research. Australia has dropped back. Our resources in this area have been cut back dramatically. And a country that once led the world in the, in the solar research effort is now very much following. There are many good scientists still left in this country, but the, but the funding is not there to provide the leadership in that area that we should be providing. Mr. President, the government just doesn't get it on climate change. It is a reflection, I think, of uh, the lack of leadership, the failure to come to terms with modern issues, the, the, the failure to come to terms with the future challenges uh, that Australia faces. Because the government just doesn't get it, they can't, they can't come to terms with leading the Australian community in tackling climate change. Now, to be fair, there's a, there's a fundamental pr problem inside the government. They don't believe that climate change is caused by human activity. The Leader in the Senate, Senator Minchin, Senator Betts himself, the Prime Minister, uh, the Industry Minister, Ms McFarlane, they actually don't believe uh, that the science about climate change is right. They are climate sceptics, and I think Senator Bernardi and others are of the same view. The Liberal Party is full of people who actually don't accept the science. Now, that's fine, but it makes them totally incapable of leading the response Australia needs to make to climate change. My view, and I think the view of most Australians, is the evidence in, is in. The science is now widely accepted in the world as that human activity is making a huge impact on climate, that we cannot go on emitting carbon at the rates we are, that we need to, have, we need to respond. But if you don't believe it, you can't respond. You can't provide the leadership necessary. So I, I accept that the government has a fundamental problem. They don't believe it, therefore they are totally hamstrung in terms of responding. And so the Prime Minister had to be dragged into doing something, as, the, as Crosby and Texter kept reinforcing to him that, in fact, Australians understand it's a problem, Australians accept the science, and that something needs to be done. But the government has failed to act in a way that would uh, provide the leadership in tackling climate change. And one of the things, Mr Deputy President, that struck me when I uh, took on the shadow uh, ministerial responsibilities for resources and energy uh, in late last year is that business get it. Business absolutely get it. Business wants the certainty of knowing what's going to happen in terms of climate change in this country. They want the certainty of knowing whether they're going to have a carbon emissions trading system. They want a price on carbon. They want to know that we're going to seriously tackle climate change because it's affecting them very fundamentally. They cannot make huge investment decisions in Australia until they know what the price of carbon is, until they know what the targets of an Australian government uh, has set and what commitment there is to renewable energy in this country. They are crying out for leadership from the Australian government. They're not getting it, but they will get it for Labor from Labor, because we will set targets, we'll sign up to Senator Kyoto, Evans, and we'll establish, establish an MREC scheme. Senator Eggleston. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy President. Um, you know, we hear this, 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 this sort of mantra from Labor time and time again that the Howard government has done nothing about greenhouse or climate change. And it is absolute nonsense, as we have said time and time again in this chamber. Usually Senator Evans gets his lieutenant, Senator Wong, or one of the other people in his party to put up this nonsensical argument, presumably because he's too embarrassed uh, to persist um, with it. But today, Senator Evans has jumped in uh, with the absolute nonsense claim that the Howard government has not done anything about greenhouse issues or climate change. Senator Evans is fully aware that one of the first things the Howard government did when it came to office in 1996 is establish the world's first greenhouse office. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if the Labor government, the previous Labor government, had any awareness of climate change, it was open to them to do so during the 1990s to establish a greenhouse office, but they did not do anything. 
And in fact, it's a matter of great pride within the coalition that the coalition can say that it established the first greenhouse office for a government anywhere in the world. Now that really probably should be enough to completely destroy the credibility of the rest of Senator Evans's remarks. One of the other comments he made was that we're doing nothing about renewables, but of course uh, we have had a very strong renewable energy program and we've committed almost $3.4 billion to initiatives that directly address climate change and over a quarter of a million for more indirect uh, measures. The Howard Government Energy White Paper is the most definitive statement on lowering greenhouse gas emissions this government has ever seen. The strategy includes, for Senator Evans' information, a $500 million low emissions technology demonstration fund, the $100 million renewable energy development initiative, so much for the Howard government, Senator Evans not doing anything about renewable energy, and most uh, significantly in terms of what Senator Evans just had to say, the $75 million Solar Cities Initiative, which very much uh, underlines our commitment to seeking to develop the science and technology to enable solar energy to be used in this country. Because, of course, Australia is blessed with abundant sunshine, and if we can develop the science of uh, solar um, uh, energy to a degree that it can be used to power um, cities and plants and uh, provide lighting along highways, then Australia will have uh, developed a very useful technology indeed. And in Victoria, we have set up the largest solar energy plant in the world at the cost of many millions of dollars. And Senator Evans, rather than criticising the Howard government in this chamber, should give credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. And the Howard government surely deserves credit for its, an imagina its imaginative initiatives in setting up uh, solar city programs around this country. Uh, the government's climate strategy uh, has also stimulated significant private investment in low emission technologies. One of, one of Senator Evans' criticisms, again, was that business wasn't happy with the government's uh, policies on climate change, but the mandatory re renewable energy target is expected to leverage $3.5 billion in private investment over the coming years. And lastly, the Prime Minister recently announced the next major plank of our climate change strategy is a national emissions trading scheme due to begin in 2012. And Senator Evans knows that, and his remarks about us not having a, an emission trading scheme are quite wrong and quite misleading. And again, the government deserves Senator Eggleston, to be congratulated. Senator Eggleston, your time has expired. Yeah. Senator Kirk. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given today in question time, also in relation to matters relating to uh, climate change. Mr Deputy President, the absolute bare truth of this matter in the climate change debate is simply that this government, the Howard government, has had 11 years to take resolute action on climate change, and it has done no such thing. What has it done? It, uh, it denies, it runs sceptical lines, and then it tries, as a last res resort, spin. The fact is, is that it has spent millions, not billions, of dollars on climate change. In fact, it has spent less than 0.05 per cent of the annual federal budget on climate change spending. <coughs> in fact, here's an inconvenient truth. During this term of the parliament alone, the Howard government will spend about the same amount on advertising, that is about $850 million, as it has spent on climate change since 1996 
that is $867 million. So in the course of the last 11 years, it spent $867 million on climate change, yet just in the term of this parliament alone, it spent almost exactly the same amount of money on government advertising. As I said before, the government spent less than 0.05 per cent of the annual federal budget on climate change. This amounts to about $5 a year for every man, woman and child in Australia. It's an absolutely minuscule amount, Mr Deputy President. As we've heard today, the government's problems on climate change are systemic. The government can't bring itself to accept that we should ratify the Kyoto uh, Protocol and that we as a nation should be sitting at the table and influencing the negotiations surrounding this matter. This government cannot bring itself to accept that a target is a perfectly reasonable public policy position to have. And as we heard uh, Senator Evans mention, a number of government members can't even bring themselves to accept the fact that we, we as human beings, have created greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to global warming. We know that there are a number of climate change sceptics within the government. And uh, in the time I have available, um, I don't have time to mention them all. The uh, government simply will not recognise that global warming will produce significant impacts on our economy, our environment and our society. Mr Acting Deputy President, it's time that the government took some responsibility for this here in Australia right now in 2007, and that is the bottom line in this debate. By contrast, Labor has indicated that it is ready, willing and able to tackle this dangerous problem of climate change. There are many things that the Labor government, that a Labor government would do. For example, we would restore Australia's international leadership on climate change. We would immediately ratify Kyoto and provide $150 million within our aid budget to assist our Pacific neighbours to adapt to climate change. A Labor government would develop a carbon market and reform our institutions. We in contrast to this government, would lead by example. We would drive a clean energy renewable revolution. Labor would increase the mandatory renewable energy target that is now languishing under this government. We've seen that the renewable industry has had to go overseas in order to make a go of it. Labor, in contrast to this government, would be, as our shadow minister has said, Peter Garrett, on a number of occasions, we would be fair dinkum about climate change. We would meet the climate change challenge, something that this government, a tired 11-year-old Howard government, has no possibility whatsoever of doing. Thank you. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Senator Kirk spoke of taking resolute action, suggested that this government over 11 years has not taken resolute action. Well, Mr Deputy President, I would contend that this government for 11 years has consistently been taking resolute action on the matters around climate change. As my good friend Senator Eggleston pointed out, this government, within just 18 months of being elected, had launched a package of investment to address climate change initiatives in 1997. This government quickly followed that up with the establishment of the Australian Greenhouse Office, and this government has since then committed some $3.4 billion in investment to address the challenges we face as a result of climate change. These are real investments, real measures taken by a government that recognises that it needs to address this issue, but rather than the rhetorical flourish we hear from the other side of the chamber, or the hyperbole we hear from the crossbenchers on the subject matter, this is a government that's looking to address it with meaningful, real, practical measures, with sensible policy outcomes that will affect change for the long term to fix this issue, but will not along the way cause enormous pain to the Australian economy. If there is one thing that Senator Kirk said that I do agree with, it's that the issue of climate change 
has the potential to have an impact on the economy. Yes, it does. And managing the threats of climate change has the potential to have an impact on the economy. And that's why this government, which has demonstrated over 11 years that it can invest in climate change, it can affect change along the way, whilst also delivering strong economic growth and benefits for all Australians, is, a, is best placed to continue to confront these challenges into the future. This is a government with a track record of strong economic management as well as a track record of addressing this very important issue. That's the tandem approach we need into the future. Now, of course, we hear an awful lot about ratification or otherwise of the Kyoto Protocol, which of course is due to expire in 2012 in any event. But this government, taking sensible steps, has ensured that we can hold the principled ground of not ratifying because we have concerns that Kyoto will not deliver for the world what is required in ensuring that other emitters are tied to targets as well. But within Australia, we have worked hard to meet the targets that were set under Kyoto for us in any event. Labor keeps trying to claim that we won't meet those targets. They hope that by saying it often enough, that will be the case. They're obviously being extremely pessimistic in their approach to this, because the data shows that of Australia's target of achieving 108 per cent of emissions at 1990 levels, we are on track. We are just 1 per cent over target for that target by 2012. We are well and truly on track when compared to numerous other countries, when compared to New Zealand, who are 13 per cent above their target, a country, of course, with a Labor government, a country that has ratified Kyoto but is not managing to achieve its targets. So it is no point, Mr Deputy President, in us having targets if we're not able to meet them. This is a government that's happily said we will meet the target, but also that we expect the rest of the community to play its role as well. Now we heard from both Senator Evans and from Senator Kirk, Senator Evans saying that this government stands outside of the international community and Senator Kirk saying that we should be sitting at the table with the international community. Well, I'm not sure, frankly, where they've been recently. We saw at the APEC summit this government taking a leadership role in placing climate change at the forefront of discussions. We are committed to developing the post-2012 arrangements for climate change management in the world. That's why this parliament, hopefully later today, will be passing the first framework for greenhouse gas reporting as part of our emissions trading scheme, which will ensure that this country is playing a leading role into the future in this very important policy area, not just at home, where we will set the standard, but also abroad in ensuring that both developed and developing countries play their role into the future. Senator Polly. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President. Um, I rise too to take note today on the important issue of global um, uh, warming and climate change. And can I first just um, make mention of Senator Eggleston and now Senator Birmingham's uh, contribution to the debate? And uh, can we uh, address the issue where Senator Eggleston would like people to give the Howard government some credit for what they've done on climate change? Well, I just think, geez, you know, that's that's a really long bow to expect the. Uh, Australian community to acknowledge what is very little that this government has, has done over 11 very long years. Can I say that in terms of uh, the contribution by uh, my uh, senators on the other side, uh, their champions are actually taking credit for anything that's good, whether it's a state government and the way the states have uh, managed the economy. But when it comes to taking responsibility for the lack of action, then we see this government running a mile. They run a mile and they're the champions of the blame game. It's uh, Kevin Rudd and the Labor Party have actually showed leadership on this very, very important issue. Yeah. And uh, recently, uh, Mr Rudd outlined uh, the details of the very clear indications of the, the need to address uh, climate change, uh, change and the serious issue and the policy agenda that the Labor Party will take forward uh, to the uh, pending election. It's the Rudd Labor government 
uh, that will take decisive action on climate change, because we believe climate change is the greatest environmental challenge facing the global community. Tackling climate change should be a national priority, but after the Howard government's 11 years of inaction and denial, Australia is now on track to increase its greenhouse pollutants by 27 per cent by 2020. In reports released earlier this year, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC, reaffirmed unequivocally what the Howard government has known since 1996 that climate change is real, it will hurt our economy, it will hurt the environment and, most importantly, it will affect our children's future. In coming decades, hotter and drier summers in the south of our country will threaten our rural communities and industries. The harsh reality of climate change is the Great Barrier Reef could be destroyed through coral bleaching, Kakadu wetlands flooded, the snowy mountains could lose much of their snow. These Australian icons are the backbone of our tourism industry and regional economies. It should be noted by the Senate what the UK Stern Review made clear last October. The cost of delay will be far greater than the cost of reducing greenhouse gas emissions now. Labor believes we can address climate change immediately with solutions that ensure the integrity of our water supply, protect our environment and secure Australian jobs and industries now and into the future. A Rudd Labor government is committed to restoring Australia's international leadership on climate change, and Labor will immediately ratify the Kyoto Protocol to help forge a global solution to climate change. Labor will aim to cut Australia's greenhouse pollutants by 60 per cent on 2000 levels by the year 2050 and introduce an effective emissions trading scheme by 2010. Labor is also committed to leading by example. Central to this point, a Labor government has committed to using its purchasing power to provide a market for new, efficient technologies. Labor has also pledged to help Australian families to green their homes. Labor will offer $10,000 low interest loans for Australian households to implement energy and water savings and provide rebate for rooftop solar panel. Now, these are real initiatives and these are part of the way to heading to a solution. And Labor has agreed to work in partnership with businesses to drive energy efficiency improvements that deliver smarter and more productive industries and establish a $500 million national clean coal fund. Labor also is willing to invest in sustainable agriculture and protect our biodiversity. We will work with farmers to encourage sustainable farming practices which reduce emissions, develop carbon sinks and protects our unique plants and animals. And as I said, it's not about uh, blaming others and wanting to take credit. It's about action. It's about leadership. And uh, I think it's uh, necessary and vitally important and something that the Howard government has not done and has shown no leadership on and I don't believe will do. Labor is the only party— Senator Polly, your time has expired. On the same matter, the question is the motion moved by Senator Evans be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no, I think the ayes have it. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move to take note of the answer given by Senator Minchin to the question I asked of him in question time today. Um, the question I asked related to the resolution moved by the, sorry, passed by the Senate earlier this morning uh, without dissent, so I presume with uh, the support of all parties in this chamber, uh, which uh, recognised, amongst other things, there's four parts to it, I won't read the whole thing out, but amongst other things, uh, the Senate recognises the importance of following up expressions of concern uh, regarding sexual assault and abuse of children and young people with genuine action to assist survivors of sexual assault and to bring perpetrators to justice. And uh, the Senate also, um, without dissent, expressed support for the long-standing call for a comprehensive royal commission into the sexual assault and abuse of children throughout Australia, especially in institutions. Now, I appreciate the uh, minister couldn't uh, you know, instantaneously give a response that uh, you know, the Prime Minister and Cabinet had considered this resolution in the space of a few hours and resolved to uh, implement a Royal Commission, although the government is capable of acting extremely quickly, it seems, on, on some issues. But I uh, appreciate for a serious issue like this you don't want to respond um, instantaneously. 
uh, but I, I do want to reinforce the key points of the resolution, which is not just that it uh, supported the calls for a royal commission, but also that it specifically recognised the importance of following up expressions of concern with genuine action. Uh, and that's certainly the point that the Democrats will continue to push uh, right through to election day and uh, for uh, as long as we have breath in our bodies, uh, that it does need more than just expressions of concern and general statements about how terrible uh, sexual assault of children is and uh, the need for us all to do more and all those sorts of things, which is uh, all well and good, but it needs to be followed up with genuine action. Now, the, the minister noted quite understandably and correctly that there's uh, you know, efforts through uh, Commonwealth and state governments to work together to improve our performance in regards to child protection. Uh, and as I've stated in this chamber a number of times before, as have people from other parties, there's uh, certainly a lot of room for improvement uh, in that regard. And uh, there we have failed pretty dismally, collectively uh, and societally, I might say, um, and across the political spectrum in uh, ensuring as much as is humanly possible a uh, safe environment for children. Uh, and I should make the point that whilst I'm urging action from government um, and political parties in this regard, uh, it is an issue where, as a society, we need to take more responsibility. It's not one of those issues, frankly, where you can expect the government to fix it. Uh, you can't expect the government to show leadership on it. You can't expect uh, some comprehensive, cohesive national strategies, uh, which in my view would include a Royal Commission or some similar type of independent commission of inquiry to comprehensively examine the issue uh, rather than deal with it in an ad hoc sort of way. Uh, and the concern uh, that I have and the Democrats have, and as part of the motivation behind this resolution, as is probably fairly obvious, uh, is that once again we had uh, a particular incident generating a lot of publicity, and this was the, the re-raising of concerns about uh, alleged incident in a youth detention centre in Brisbane some time ago and uh, you know, the need for the fact that the issues of justice regarding that had not been resolved, that is a serious issue, needs action. Uh, but obviously there's politics involved in that, obviously that's part of um, why it had resurfaced um, and I think we need to be making sure that we look comprehensively at this issue as a whole and as much as possible in a non-partisan and independent way not have uh, a sudden focus on one area because there's political scandal, political opportunity or just you know, media heat or whatever it is. Uh, and that's why I think we, we need to be having some uh, national cooperation and, and uh, leadership on the issue. And that includes uh, the sort of comprehensive examination of the totality of the issue that I don't believe we've ever had. We've had bits and pieces here and there regarding specific institutions, specific groups in the community, specific regions, uh, specific churches. Um, some done by independent bodies, some done by governments, some done by departments. Uh, we haven't had a comprehensive nationwide examination and that's why the Democrats keep supporting this call, which others in the community have also made. And that's why I would reinforce our request to government to act on this and the opposition leader, uh, obviously moving to a period where he's putting himself as the alternative prime minister, to act on this as a matter of urgency and get a comprehensive uh, examination and action follow up those expressions of concern with action and do so as a matter of urgency. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Bartlett be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Macdonald.